So before we get into covalent compounds, how about this one? Magnesium nitride. Magnesium nitride. Okay, good, good. Uh, good question. If it's a single atom, like nitrogen, it's IDE. If it's polyatomic, if it has multiple atoms, it's 8. All right. It's one of the other suffixes. So IDE only applies to single atoms. I'm trying to think if there are any exceptions, but I don't think so. What? A single element, yeah. yeah. Sorry, single element. OK, how about this one? Yeah. Copper 2 iodide or cupric iodide or cupric iodide. Okay. Well, this one. Okay, close. Can tin have more than one oxidation state? Yes. Yes. So what is this one? This is tin to ox. Also known as stannous oxide. Tin to oxide. That's a tough one. Oh, that one. Cesium fluoride, right. Cesium fluoride. OK. One more. No, let's do a couple more. Close. Now you're closer before. All right, it's magnesium. I think we got that. What's that ion? That's acetate. Acetate. Also sometimes written as CH3CO2 or CH3COO. That's all. Acetate. So this is magnesium acetate. It's not magnesium 2 acetate because magnesium only has one charge, which is 2, one oxidation state. OK, now we'll do the last one. Sodium per bromate. Sodium per bromate. Do so you have an idea for what kind of stuff you need to work on this week? According to this? Okay, let's move on and get you some more stuff to work on. Because that isn't enough. Come on. You've got a whole week. Um, all right. So that's all the ionic compounds. Now you can name any ionic compound that you want. Let's move to 
covalent compounds. Covalent compounds are named a little bit differently, which is nice because uh, it, it helps you separate them, really, so you know what you're talking about. Here's the rules for naming for covalent compounds. I think they're actually a bit easier. First element in the formula is full element name. Second element is named as though it were an anion, even though in a covalent compound it's not. And then you use prefixes to denote the number of atoms present. Um, so you've got mono, di, tri, tetra, so on, penta, whatever. But mono is usually not used for the first element, just for the other ones. So CO is carbon monoxide, not monocarbon monoxide. SiO2 is silicon dioxide, not monosilicon dioxide, and so on. So these are, are fairly straightforward, I think. Let's fill in these missing names. If you've got them, fill them in. You've got the, the papers. Otherwise, fill them in on your paper, and then we'll talk about them all together. What do you get for the first one? Dinitrogen monoxide. Okay. Dinitrogen monoxide. Okay. What about N2O3? Dinitrogen trioxide. And N2O5? Right. Di. Pentoxide. Okay. And we usually drop the last letter of the prefix when it's followed by a vowel. So we would say uh, pentoxide, not pentaoxide. But if that were, let's say, bromine, we would say pentabromide, not pentbromide. No. No, you got to use dye. Um, I, I don't think there's a good reason for that. That's just how it is. Uh, Bi or bis means other things in naming, so we'll use that in another way, eventually. No. Uh, yeah, it would be technically dihydrogen monoxide. Um, yeah, so I, no, I, I don't know. Have you guys heard that? I, I haven't heard hydrogen dioxide there, but you've heard that? Hi, hydrogen dioxide? Yeah, sorry. Um, so, of course, H2O, NH3, CH4, we don't name this way. We call them what? The first one is the H2O, NH3, and CH4. The first one is called water. Okay, I was a little concerned about the silence there. <laughs> we may need to go back a little further. NH3 is ammonia, and CH4 is methane. Methane, yeah. Right. So what do you look for for these? You look for no metal. Right? Notice all of these are, made of, are, are compounds of non-metals. 
If there are metals present, we can assume it's ionic, and we use the previous naming rules that we just went over. So here's kind of a mix of them all together, uh, four of them. I want you to try these out on your own, and then we'll talk about them. So go for it. OK, so P4O10, how do you name that? That's right. Careful. Tetraphosphorus, not phosphate. Phosphate is PO4, right? That's an ion. So tetraphosphorus pentoxide. Whoop. Decoxide. I sorry. So nobody calls this that. P4O10 is, as you know, the double formula of P2O5, which is diphosphorus pentoxide. So that's where I was getting that. But if you wanted to name it as P4O10, this is how you would do it. Tetraphosphorus decoxide. You should know the prefix is up to 10. I don't care if you know the other ones, but you should know it's mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, Octa, nana or nona, and deca. All right, next one. What'd you get? What's the problem with that one? So let's, let's start with that, if, if I might take your answer. Up. Not to offend you or anything, but. So diniobium pentoxide. What's wrong with that name? It's not a non-metal. It's not a covalent compound. It's an ionic compound. How'd you know that? Yeah, you look at the periodic table. So um, if you're not sure, or if you can't remember, or whatever, you, if you can sort of make a pretty good guess by how far to the left or the right it is. So niobium is element number 41, uh, probably more in the metal category. So knowing that, how would you name it? Close. There you go. So it's niobium, and, and being a transition metal, we can assume that this will have multiple oxidation states. How do we determine what number to put in there? That's right. We have to look at the anion and then balance the charge. So what's, gen what's the charge of oxide? Minus 2. So what's the overall minus charge in Nb2O5? Minus 10. So then how many, what needs to be the charge on each niobium to balance that out? Plus 5, right? So that's niobium 5 oxide. And there's no clever common name for that. All right, what about uh, Li2O2? Hmm. Is that lithium oxide? Wait a second. So you tell me the answer, but then you say, well, how did you get that? <laughs> so let's look at this. Let's go, let's go the other way. Let's go backwards. If I said write lithium oxide, what would you write? Lithium oxide, what would it be? Li. Li. Well, hold on. So let's look at it. Lithium oxide. What's the charge on lithium always? And what's the charge on oxygen? Minus 2. So what would, be li what would lithium oxide be to balance that out? Li2O. Right, Li2O, because we know lithium is going to be plus 1. Okay. There are no exceptions for those first two rows. Okay. No exceptions. It's always either plus 1 for the first row or plus 2 for the second row. No exceptions that you'll encounter, let's put it that way. There's never no exceptions. Um, so this can't also be lithium oxide. 
So oxygen actually is the exception. It's usually almost always minus 2. But in this case, what's the charge on each oxygen? Minus 1. So it's actually oxygen in a um, different oxidation state. So this is lithium peroxide. This is one of the polyatomic ions, O2, 2 minus, which is peroxide. That's a tricky one, because usually oxygen is regular minus 1. Um, but the oxygen does have an exception in peroxide. Lithium does not have an exception. Uh, none of the alkali or alkaline earth metals. So to answer your question, that's how, I, how, that's how you know something weird is going on here is that those will not have exceptions that we'll encounter. All right, and then the last one. Close. It is titanium. And let's put the parentheses there, and we'll get it in a second. And the ion is nitrate. And what should be in the parentheses? Four, right. Titanium four nitrate. OK, let's go the other way. Here are four names that I want you to put into formulas. What do you think about the first one? All right, we got a vote for V2F5. Is that right? VF5. Why VF5? Okay. So if vanadium has to be 5, then fluorine, there must be 5 fluorines to balance it out. Uh, technically, we could call this V2F10, but in ionic compounds, we usually don't. We usually go with the smallest possible numbers there. All right, what about B, dioxygen difluoride? O2F2, right. See, the, the molecular covalent ones are generally the easier ones. OK, what about C? Yeah, we just talked about that one. So that's going to be RB2O2. And D? All right, we got GAO. Is that right? What do you think? Or GA2O? GA203. All right, what makes you think that one? <laughs> GA302. We're getting everything here. What? <laughs> Element 31, yep. Yeah. Right, so this one's kind of tricky because you can't just know the charge of oxygen and figure out gallium. You actually have to know the charge of gallium also. Um, and that's one we haven't talked about. But if you look at the periodic table, you might be able to figure it out based on some of the other things we know. So gallium's number 31. What charge would you guess is it has and why? Three? Why three? Yeah, if you ignore the transition metals, it kind of goes the next over from, from the two. So a good guess is that it's three. So in fact, this is the correct answer because that's the only way to balance a 3 plus with a 2 minus. Okay. Aluminum also has a co commonly has a charge of plus 3, uh, and boron is a nonmetal and doesn't tend to make uh, ionic compounds uh, in this way anyway. All right, last thing we need to talk about naming, and then we'll get over to moles, is acids. 
we're going to talk a lot about acids before the semester is up. Don't worry. And if you take the second semester, you're going to really talk a lot about acids. Um, but for now, we're just going to talk about naming them. I know you're excited. I know. We can talk about them another time if you want. But um, we only get to talk about naming right now. OK. Acids are named in a couple ways, but you can sort of assume that an acid is an anion with one or more hydrogen ions attached. So they sort of mirror a lot of the naming that we've already done. But instead of having a metal as the positive charge, we have an H plus as the positive charge, a hydrogen. Okay. And then you got two categories, I think. Yep. Sometimes I forget what's coming next. but Two categories. The, the anion either does or does not contain oxygen. If it does not contain oxygen, then we put the prefix hydro and the suffix ic. So HCl becomes hydrochloric acid. HBr becomes hydrobromic. HI becomes hydroiodic. H2S. Uh, that was a trick one. H2S isn't an acid, right? It's a. What? It's actually just a non metal. So this is known as hydrogen sulfide. Right, not an acid. And HCN? Yes, but as an acid would be hydrocyanic acid. And then if it does contain oxygen, we have to use those fancy words. The acidic name is formed from the root of the anion name with the suffix ic or us, depending on some more rules. And this will seem really confusing, but we'll get it in a second. If the anion name ends in eight, then we use the suffix ic. If the anion ends in ite, then we use us. All right. So. Let's practice that and you'll get a feel for it. H2SO3 has the sulfate, sulfite anion, SO3 2 minus. So we call it sulfurous acid. Right, so ite us, ite us, eight ic. If it were sulfate, it would be sulfuric acid. The way I remember these is to remember a couple that I know, like sulfuric acid. I always remember sulfuric acid as H2SO4. So if I forget if it's 8, ic, us, whatever, I know the SO4 is sulfate and H2SO4 is sulfuric acid, so then I can figure out the rest of them from that. However you want to remember them uh, is up to you. But let's practice a little bit and maybe it'll be, become a little bit clearer. So HClO4 is going to be, uh, it comes from the perchlorate anion, so what do we call the acid? Perchloric acid, very, very nasty acid. Uh, HClO3, the ion is chlorate, so that is chloric acid. HClO2. And HClO. Hypochlorous acid. All right, let's practice these a little bit more. How about Hc2H3O2?
This would be acetic. So the anion is acetate, right? Acetate, so ate becomes ick. So it's acetic. What about HNO2? Close. What's the anion here? It's nitrite. So the acid is called nitrous acid. All right. Do so you think you got that stuff? Maybe. Maybe, maybe. A couple more. And then we will uh, head back and talk a little bit about moles. Hmm? Not quite. What's the anion here? Carbonate. So what's the acid? Carbonic acid, yeah. This is what you have in uh, soft drinks. There is no bicarbonate, because if it's just another acid, uh, it's just another hydrogen, it becomes this. So. All right, let's make a little flow chart. The book has this, I think it's kind of helpful, of how to figure these out if you have no context. Like, you just, I just give you a formula, you have to figure out how to name it. All right, here's what you do. First thing you look at, is it, is it ionic or covalent? Okay, that's your first choice. Let's say it's ionic. There were two types of ionic compounds, right? There was type 1 where you didn't have the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, type 1, what was type 1? T type 1 didn't have any uh, different oxidation states, right, different charges. It was just 1. So that was type 1. And then you just name it accordingly. So if it's type 1, it it's, looks something like this. Sodium chloride. If you want to think of it in terms of what that name comes from, type 1 is always the name of the cation, the name of the anion. That's it. There's no numbers. There's no prefixes. That's it. Okay. If it's type 2, that's when you have something like iron 3 chloride. Those are the ones where you have possible varying oxidation states, and you have to name it accordingly by having something in parentheses. So then the other side is if it's covalent. If it's covalent, then you have to ask yourself, Something else. Is it an acid? If yes, then I'm just going to cheat a little bit here. I'm just going to say use acid rules. If you want to continue the flow chart to actually include those rules, if it has oxygen or not, and go on, go ahead. But we just, that was the previous page, was the acid rule. So go back and take a look at that. If it's not, 
then you name it and uh, making sure to specify the number of each atom. So things like diphosphorus pentoxide. Right. Where you have the prefixes as we discussed. point of all this is your first, or the most important point of this, is your first decision is always ionic or covalent. I think most people get these wrong by miss, first missing that and naming an ionic as a covalent or a covalent as an ionic. So look for your metals and catch that one first and then go from there. Okay. Want to try a couple more before we go on? Yes. All right. Try a couple. I'm going to give you a couple. I'm not going to tell you what category they fit in. I'm just going to write them down. And then uh, you see if you can give me some names. And then I'm going to do one where you have to put the name also. OK, give those a try, and then we'll move on. OK. All right, let's start with this one, because we were just talking about it. So it's, if SB is antimony, how do you name that one? This would be antimony what? Well, is it ionic or covalent? It's a bad example, actually, because <laughs> it's actually, it is technically covalent, but we name it like it's ionic um, because it's on the other side of the staircase there. So we call this one antimony sulfide. Um, though from a molecular standpoint, technically it is a covalent structure. That's okay. Okay. Well, I can now that we've talked about it, right? <laughs> what? No, why would I use my examples in the test? But then you wouldn't have to think about it. You just do the, just remember. No, I don't know. They might. I don't like go back and make sure I don't use any examples, but it's an element. <laughs> what does it do? I, it makes rocks. It's, uh, it's actually uh, the compounds of sulfur and, selena and selenium with antimony are important uh, semiconductors, that, which we'll talk about later what that means, but it, it has to do with their electrical capabilities. So you'll see antimony in certain materials. Um, there's a bit of a toxicity to it, so it's not used in a lot of like consumer things. But, uh, but yeah, it's important. It's important in a lot of, a lot of uh, advanced electronic materials. Um, all right, so that said, let's go over to this bismuth telluride. So you don't know uh, the common charge of bismuth, and you probably don't know of tellurium either. So you go to the periodic table, and you find bismuth where? 83, and tellurium where? 52. So you have a compound between a group 5A element and a group 6A element. Have you seen one of those before? Yeah, like antimony sulfide, right? So you might expect, you might not be right, but you might expect or you might guess that you'd have similar ratios between other compounds in the same group. And in this case, you would be right. Bismuth telluride is Bi2. TE3. And again, that's sort of a guess. 
That's not absolutely this must be it. That's sort of a guess um, because you know some things about that row of, of, with nitrogen. You know some things about the calcogenides in row 6A. All right, let's get these other three. Um, how about NaOCl? Sodium hypochlorite, good. Otherwise known as? It does have a common name. Anybody? What was that? Oh no, this one, this one. What's the common name of this one? Not quite. It's bleach. 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 Oh, okay. Um, okay, let's go with the next one then. What type of a compound is this? Is this going to be ionic or covalent? Ionic, right? And is it going to be type 1? It doesn't have different states. Or type 2, it does probably have different states. Probably type 2 because of where it is. So what's the name? Rhodium 2 acetate, right. All right, and the last one, SO3. Sulfur trioxide, good. The trick here, it's not really a trick, but the place where you could possibly get tripped up is to think of, to, we're so used to seeing like SO3 2 minus, and we think that's sulfite. So we call this sulfite. But this isn't an ion. This is a molecule, a neutral molecule. So it's sulfur trioxide. It's a covalent molecule. So don't mix up the ion names with the molecule names, because sometimes they look similar. All right, good naming. A couple of last things to talk about. Let's switch gears here and go way back to some masses. All right. Have you heard this word before, stoichiometry? How would you define it? Very numbery. Balancing of atoms or molecules. Yeah, it's a big word for something that is really not that complicated. Um, it's just quantities. It means the quantities. Um, what's consumed and what's produced in a chemical reaction. That's it. Um, you, when we talk about the stoichiometry, we're usually talking about calculating how much of something you'll need to do the reaction. Right? You want to do a reaction between two chemicals, you need to know how much of each to use. So you have to do some calculations, and we often refer to that as the stoichiometry. Another part of that is how much are you going to get? You got this much of this, this much of this, you mix them together, how much of your product are you going to get? That's also an issue of stoichiometry. So we're going to do all of that eventually. We're not going to get into that right now today. Um, we're just kind of we're going to do some basic steps with regard to that that you've probably heard of. Um, okay, so atomic masses. We discussed this earlier today. Atomic mass units are uh, an arbitrarily defined thing. Okay, carbon twelve is defined as having twelve atomic mass units or Daltons. That shouldn't have an apostrophe. It's not like a real measure of something. It's not you don't put an atom of carbon on something. We just say carbon, it has this done. All right? And then we take everything else from that. Uh, but what that does is it basically tells us that any atom with a certain number of protons and a certain number of neutrons is going to have a mass of the number of no neutrons plus the number of protons. Makes it a whole lot easier than dealing with those numbers we talked about last week the, the actual masses of the protons and the neutrons, which are crazy small numbers. And here's the thing that we're going to not use next week, but pretend we use next week, uh, because we don't have lab on one day. 
that actually measures masses of individual atoms and molecules, and it's called a mass spectrometer. Sample goes in the left, okay, and a vaporized sample, and then a beam of charged particles, electrons primarily, and other ions, hit the electron beam, hit the sample. And when the electrons hit the sample, they knock electrons off of the sample. So the sample is now an ion. So the molecule or the atom is now an ion. Then it's accelerated through this thing, and magnetic field separates the particles. Because if a, a lighter particle will be more strongly pulled by a magnet than a heavier particle because of the inertia that the heavier particle carries through. So the more the particle is affected by these magnetic fields, the lightest it can be. Or I'm sorry, in this diagram, it's the opposite. Uh, the lightest particles stay to, toward the center, and the heaviest particles veer the most away. At any rate, it, it separates things by mass. Oh, we already talked about this. This is the thing I um, got. Uh, this is the thing I talked about before. If you, here's the actual, uh, the actual weighted average. So if you take the carbon-12 that's 99.9%, 98.89%, and then the, um, or I'm sorry, 98.9%. And then you take carbon-13, which is 1.11%, and you put those together, you get 12.01 AMUs, which is actually closer to what you see. So we, we talked about that. Now, here's what's really important. We've gone through all this stuff and these various things. For the purposes of calculations, which we're going to keep doing throughout the rest of the semester, uh-oh. Lose my computer in a second. Um, we could consider to carbon to be a composed of only one type of atom with a mass of 12.01, even though we know that atom doesn't actually exist. So any sample that's large enough for you to actually handle, even if it's a tiny, tiniest grain, is going to have millions and millions and billions of atoms in there. So it's effectively an average anyway. The only time you don't deal with averages is if you're really looking at individual atoms. And the only time that happens is in a mass spectrometer, effectively. So when we do calculations, we're not going to talk about carbon-12 or carbon-13 or bromine-79 or bromine-81. When we do stoichiometric calculations, we're going to use those numbers right there and assume that bromine is made up of a sample with bromine atoms that are 79.9 atomic mass units each because the average actually works out that way overall. Next part of stoichiometry, the mole. What do you know about moles? They're what? They're ugly? Yeah. Have you heard of this before? You've heard of it? The what? Mm hmm. Isn't that the amount of carbon atoms in the program symbol of carbon? Wow, how did you get that? It's almost like it's written right up there. Oh, wait, yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so a mole is, the number, is defined as the number of carbon atoms in exactly 12 grams of pure carbon 12. The number is actually, anybody know? All right, got a little work to do. It is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd power. Right. Does it have units? No, it doesn't have units. It's simply a number. Um, I always compare it to a dozen. A dozen, if I tell you you have a dozen of something, it means you have a certain number. Anybody know what that is? Twelve, right? It means you have twelve of something. Same thing with a mole. If I tell you you have a mole of something, it means you have that many of them. A mole of donuts, a lot, would be delicious. Probably not good for you. We'd have to do that problem that we did last time about gaining the pounds in the cylinder for a while. Um, but you could have a mole of anything. It's simply a number. All right? And it's a huge number. There's some interesting things about it. Like a mole of seconds is four million times the entire existence of the Earth, four billion years. That's a lot. Um, a mole of marbles 
would cover the entire surface of the United States to a depth of 70 miles. That's a lot. So it's a huge, huge number. And it kind of tells us about the size of things we're dealing with. Atoms are, and molecules are so small that we actually have to have this many to have sort of a tangible amount. Um, and that's indeed why it's useful. A mole of any element, based on how we'd have just defined it, is equal to its atomic mass in grams. So if you have 26.981538 grams of aluminum, you have exactly one mole of aluminum, which is exactly that many atoms. That's where it's useful. A mole of any atom is that many grams of that atom. So really what it is is a conversion factor. This many atoms per one mole. And we can fit this into those conversion problems that we've already been doing. So let's do a couple calculations here. If we have 10.0 grams of aluminum, how many moles of aluminum are there? And how many atoms of aluminum are there? And we're going to set it up the same way we set up all those other conversions before. We're going to start with grams, because that's what we're given. And then we're going to convert to moles. So we need a conversion that gives us grams and moles. 10.0 grams times something. We need to know how many moles are in a gram or how many grams are in a mole. How do we figure that out so that we can cancel grams? And actually, let's be more specific here. We have 10 grams of aluminum. That's right. This is where we use the periodic table. Those red numbers become our conversion factors. We go up to aluminum, 26.98. So we'll say there are 27.0 grams of aluminum in one mole of aluminum. Okay. All right, and we do that math and get 0 0.370 moles of aluminum. By the way, MOL is the abbreviation for mole much faster than having to write that E. It's, it's a great abbreviation. Um, I think it's just sort of, you can't do M, because M is meters. You can't do MO, because MO is months. So you got to go MOL. It's the shortest one we've got. Sorry. All right, do you see how that conversion factor works? You take any element. That red thing is your conversion factor. It is grams per mole. Grams in one mole is that red number. All right, now let's go to molecules. What do we multiply moles by to get molecules? What's our conversion factor there? Or atoms, not, not molecules. That's right, we use that number. So again, we're going to set up our conversion where we have now moles on the bottom and atoms on the top. And there are 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd atoms in one mole. We multiply those together, and we get 2.23 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of aluminum. All right, now you try one. 5.02 milligrams of gold. How many moles are there, and how many atoms are there? All right, let's try it. So we know we know that gold is 197 grams per mole, but we're given milligrams. So we really first have to convert milligrams to grams. Um, maybe we can do that in our heads now. How many grams is 5.02 milligrams? Yeah, we can either do it in scientific notation or not. We can say 5.02 times 10 to the minus 3 grams of gold times, and then we want to get grams of gold. We want to cancel grams of gold 
and end up with moles of gold. And we can look up that number and say, okay, that means we've got 197 grams of gold per one mole of gold. And that gives us Uh, 2.55 times 10 to the minus 5 moles, is that correct? Yep. Of, of gold. And then you can use the same factor here to get the number of atoms. Um, one thing you should also note here that you can do you can actually keep everything in milligrams and end up with millimoles and then convert later. So we could say that this is 5.02 milligrams times 1 millimole of gold over 197 milligrams of gold. Do you see how I can do that? Everything is milla now. So as long as you do it to everything, the ratios stay the same. And then my answer is going to be in millimoles, which comes out to 0 0.0255 millimoles of gold. Um, sometimes when we're using small quantities, especially organic reactions, you'll certainly encounter this in your organic chemistry classes if you go do that. We almost exclusively work in millimoles rather than moles because the quantities are smaller and the uh, m molecules are larger. All right, we've got 15 minutes. We can do it. Did you say no? <laughs> <laughs> I, sort of, I sort of am sympathetic toward that. I kind of want to just fall over and go to sleep on the floor, but that's all right. Um, all right, the molar mass. What's a molar mass then? What's a molar mass? A molar mass is simply, would you like to read the definition again, or should, should I? Okay. It's the mass per mole of any material. How much of the material is in one mole? For atoms, that's easy. It's those numbers, right? We just talked about that. 197 grams of gold in a mole. For larger molecules, it's not that much harder. You just need to add everything up. So you can figure this out for any element or substance by summing the atomic masses of each element in the molecule. So let's try it. The molar mass of water. How many grams are in one mole of water? How do you figure that out? It's about 18. You add them up. So you say water, each hydrogen is about one. We'll just throw significant figures out the window right now. Um, each hydrogen is about one. Each oxygen is about 16. We've got two hydrogens. So that's 2 times 1 for each hydrogen plus 16 for the oxygen equals 18. And that unit is grams per mole or grams per one mole. And that's molar mass. You can also think of it as a conversion factor. 18 grams of water per one mole of water. So we need to cancel accordingly. How about sodium chloride? What's the mass of one mole of sodium chloride? Careful. Remember, sodium chloride is now the whole thing. So the mass is going to be the mass of sodium, which is 23, plus the mass of one chloride, which is 35. So overall, we're going to have 58 grams per mole for sodium chloride. How about calcium carbonate? Let's at least set it up. What, what are we going to add together here? 40 plus 12 plus 3 times 16 for oxygen, because there's three oxygens, which, yeah, is 48. 
So you end up with 100. Get the idea? All right, should we try some more, or you, you think you got this? What? Think you're good? All right, one more just to be safe. <laughs> Let's try the last one, acetaminophen. Don't give it to your dog, by the way. Yes. What? No, actually, but uh, I don't know why that came into my head. Don't give people medicines to dogs without your vet's consent. H9, C8, H9, and O2. Um, maybe. We can look at it. We'll talk about it next week, though, on Wednesday, because... Okay, I'll, I'll open it up. We'll talk about it. Here we go. What did you get for this one? Anybody get it? 151, I think that's right. That's right. So to do this, we take that there's eight carbons, 12 each, nine hydrogen, one each, plus nitrogen, plus two, whoops, N. That's going to be 14 plus two times 16 for oxygen. Fifty-one. Right. Be, be do when you actually do these. Do be careful with significant figures. Use the appropriate amount of decimal places, as dictated by your given problem, so you get the right answer. But you, you get the idea here, right? All right. Um, let me quick show you what's going on with the. Uh,